So good morning, everyone. I'm going to present my master thesis about discovering and learning of navigation goals from Pixels in Minecraft under the supervision of Xavier Giro and Victor Campos. And as you can see, there is no reference to reinforcement learning in the title, although this is the base of our work. And uh, reinforcement learning is a subtype of machine learning that consists of an agent that could be a physical robot or a simulated one, like, like the one that's using the slide, that performs some action in the environment uh, and in a given state. And uh, then it receives some feedback or some reward of how well was this action performed in this state and at the next step. These uh, kind of algorithms uh, have been tested and assessed a lot in games because they already present a similar setup where the reward function is kind of the, the score of the game. So for instance, here you have this agent playing in the Minecraft uh, game. And the, the goal of this agent is to find and, and mine a uh, um, diamond block. This is actually a challenge in the NeoRips conference and that nobody has ever achieved yet. So you can imagine the difficulty of, of this task. So, um, well, the, the difficulty of this task because you have to perform a, a very long sequence of actions that uh, probably you, you cannot uh, perform by chance. So um, what we would like to have is some kind of skills that, um, um, that with a hierarch hierarchical policy on top, for instance, we could uh, perform more complex tasks and, um, and solve these this kind of, uh, of challenges. And these kind of skills could be, for instance, uh, navigation, um, navigation skills where the agent is trying to gather resources around the world or it could be uh, like mining, like the one you're seeing on the on the video, or also cutting down trees to gather some wood and, and, and well, some cut these trees to to make some wood. And ideally, we would like that these skills are um, discovered in a unsupervised way, with without the need of rewards or uh, external labels. And this is inspired by the, by the success of self-supervised methods in the in other fields like computer vision and uh, natural language processing. So here I, I put a couple of examples of these uh, methods, like the one presented by Facebook, Facebook AI recently about the video object segmentation and the already famous language model GPT-3 by OpenAI. But how do these uh, self-supervised methods work? So they extract some features from huge unlabeled data sets and uh, these extracted features allow to perform much better in other uh, downstream tasks. But um, how we can transfer these ideas to the RL world, to the reinforcement learning world, and what kind of pre-trained task uh, could we use uh, for our uh, agents? And moreover, prob probably extracting features like we do in computer vision or NLP it is not enough. Uh, we rather learn to we want to learn some uh, behaviors or skills that can be transferred to perform some um, more complex tasks. So to develop this uh, unsupervised RL, um, we could rely on this uh, on some intrinsic motivations that do not rely on, on third party uh, defining some extrinsic reward over parameterized or, or whatever. So we could use this intrinsic motivation that it's called empowerment where an agent trying to maximize it, is it, um, it want, the, the, the agent will want to obtain the maximum control over the environment by learning what can be done and how. This empowerment was introduced in early 2014. And since then, it has been used by plenty of work, of works uh, by, to discover some set of skills, like the ones that you see here. And most of these works have used uh, an information theoretic metric uh, the, which is the mutual information to maximize this empowerment uh, kind of framework. Uh, another work that uses this empowerment is uh, the one that you see here, Explore, Discover and Learn by Victor Campos, uh, where they demonstrate that uh, previous works uh, have a lack of coverage of the state space. So for instance, here you see an example of a 2D continuous maze where the skills discovered uh, and learned by these, these baselines uh, based on empowerment, uh, discover and reinforce skills that, uh, that can be reached by a random policy that you see uh, over here. 
So as you can see, IDEAL overcome these issues by presenting this new paradigm that consists in these three different phases, explore, discover, and learn that we are gonna see in detail now. So here we have these three phases, and in this paradigm, they ask you to, uh, in, in the exploration phase, they, they ask you to define some state distribution and how you are gonna sample from it. And we could have two different ways that they, um, they present in, in the paper. One could be to, um, to induce this distribution by leveraging uh, extreme um, expert trajectories. That is actually what we are gonna do in our implementation, and I will show you later. And you could also induce this uh, state distribution with, a, for instance, an exploratory policy that induces a uniform state distribution over the state space. And they, this is actually what they do in their paper. Then in this second phase, which is the discovery of, the, of the skills, once we have this um, distribution over the state space, they uh, learn this mapping from the state distribution to some latent variables because we want to maximize this mutual information between these two uh, variables. And you can also define uh, the intrinsic reward that we're going to see later on. And in, the, in their case, they made use of a variational, uh, well, in particular, they use a vector quantized variational autoencoder that we will see again in, in a minute. And then in the last phase, the, they learn some behaviors by, by training uh, some condition policies on the latent that we have discovered in the previous phase. But uh, it has a problem and the, the reward in, in their case, well, if, if you want to scale these from coordinates to pixels, um, th there is a problem that the reward is based on the mean square error and the, this distance between the reconstruction of the observation and the actual observation does not match the distance in the environment space. So we have to come up some, with some alternatives. And in our work, we, we study either using uh, the reverse form of the mutual information that we're gonna see in, in details in the next uh, sec, uh, slide, and also using some contrastive techniques instead of variational inference uh, so our implementation will consist on, on deploying an, an agent on different uh, maps and we want that this agent discovers some navigate, uh, navigation goals that do not overlap between them and later on once we have discovered these um, navigation goals we want to train some policies conditioned on these skills or, or goals and uh, that will guide this agent towards the, these regions. So uh, our uh, implementation of these three phases of the ideal paradigm consists in, in this. So for instance, in the, in the first uh, phase, we induce the, the state distribution from expert trajectories. And since we have this, uh, this data set that is provided by MinerL, and in particular, we make use of the Navigate task, which is composed of trajectories recorded by human real players that were trying to solve this task that consists in finding a diamond block, which is actually different from the one I explained at the beginning of the presentation, which was obtain diamond, which is much more difficult because here you don't have a compass that guides the agent. The diamond block is underground and then you have to mine it, not just find it. Um, and for mining, you have to build uh, iron Picasso and so on. So it, it's much more complex. In, in this task, it's just exploring your environment and finding this diamond block. So you we will induce the, our state distribution from these uh, trajectories. And then um, for the discovery part, we want to maximize this em empowerment and uh, for, for doing that, we want to maximize the mutual information between uh, some inputs and some latent variables. And this mutual information can be defined in two ways. One would be the, the forward form, where you have the uncertainty on the state distribution minus the uncertainty left on the state distribution when you know the, the latent distribution, and the other way around with the uncertainty of the latent distribution minus the uncertainty left on the latent distribution 
when you know the state distribution. Uh, we are gonna um, derive the reverse form since uh, the four one form will lead to the problem that we were mentioning in the EDL uh, slides. Yeah, that we can explain it later on in more, more detail. So um, if we derive this reverse form, the this conditional um, entropy is defined with this uh, with this posterior distribution, which is unknown. So we want to approximate it somehow. And um, given the non-negative uh, property of the KL divergence, we are going to maximize this lower bond, and we will uh, approximate this this function with either variational or contrastive approaches. Um, the variational ones are the, the more common that maps these states from to the latents by reconstructing some observations. And in the contrastive case, we are going to learn this latent space by uh, learning an, an, an embedding. We're, we're going to learn this embedding space by uh, mapping observations that are uh, from, from the same trajectories with a given delay or, or it could be fixed or, or sampled from, from a Gaussian distribution closed in this embedding space and trajectories that are independent from different trajectories will want them further away in the embedding space. We can see this in more details in the Q&A if you have more questions. And then since we want to maximize this mutual information, this second term over here, um, we will define it maximum entropic by defining a categorical uniform distribution over the latent space. And this is actually quite useful if we define it categorical because in the last phase in the learning, uh, we can sample one of these uh, categorical embeddings that will condition our policy in the, in the learning phase. So the reward that we are going to give to our agent will uh, rely on this conditional policy. If the encoded observation, the current observation of the agent um, is close to, an, to the embedding that we are conditioning in our policy, we will give a reward of one and zero otherwise. And this is in the variational case is computed as a Euclidean distance in the latent space. And in the contrastive case, uh, it is measured as a similarity uh, with a similarity metric. So um, now I'm going to show the two pipelines that we have in the variational and in the contrastive case. And then we will show some, some experiments. So in the variational case, uh, for the skill discovery, we have this uh, the, the same uh, neural network that uh, EDL has is a vector quantized variational twin color that uh, instead of having uh, mean and variance like in, in the classic variational twin color, we have a code book of embeddings here. That, for instance, we could have a 10 uh, length code book of 128 or 256 uh, vector length. And um, we are going to train this whole network with the reconstruction laws and this commitment laws. Although this uh, code book, uh, this code book is not going to uh, be updated with the with these laws, but it's going to be uh, trained or updated with the exponential moving average of this the output of this encoder. And once we have this uh, code book learned, with that each of these uh, embeddings is in charge of. Uh, encoding some regions of the state space, of, and we can sample from this categorical distribution, and we can co concatenate this embedding with the output of the encoded observation of the agent. And if we forward this concatenation through a multi-layer perceptron, uh, we can get these Q values that are, uh, as I explained at the beginning, uh, like the quality of the action performed in a given state, we can optimize uh, the RL agent by using the rainbow algorithm. So in the contrastive case, instead of, instead of an encoder-decoder architecture, what we have is a CMS architecture with two encoders in parallel. And as I said, we, we use these uh, positive and negative pairs that are delayed observations uh, from a trajectory uh, that are, um, which with this info and C laws, um, we can update these, these encoders. And um, here, since we don't have an, an implicit uh, clusterization of the latent space, as we have 
in the BQBA, we have to perform uh, manually a clustering over the, the, the latent space to have this categorical latent. But once we have done this, and we have the same setup we had before, so we can concatenate the incoded observation with the conditional latent and so on. So now I'm gonna show some experiments. In both uh, skill discovery and skill learning phases, uh, first, uh, well, this the skill discovery. Um, this is quite difficult to assess because we don't have these uh, rewards or, or, or labels, so we have to come up to with uh, different methods to, to assess this. And uh, also, I'm, I'm going to show you um, different uh, skills discovered by random trajectories or also from expert uh, trajectories. For instance, here uh, we have this uh, simple handcrafted map. This is a, a top view where we have a, a flat map that contains no, nine different regions with different floors. And um, if we run random trajectories over here with a random policy, uh, we can get, for instance, one of the observations from one trajectory, which is one of these points, because we, we record not only the observation, but also the coordinate uh, of, of the observation, and we can encode it through the, the through the encoder, uh, either the variation or the contrastive one, and we can compute the index of the closest embedding to our observation, and the all the index of this codebook uh, is mapped to a different color, so we can generate one of these uh, maps that you see here that we call index maps. So as you can see, in the variational case, the skills discovered are quite uh, discrete and the, the regions are quite, quite uh, distinguishable with, um, among them. Although here we can see that two of them are mapped as the same um, navigation goal or the same skill. But as you can see in the contrastive case, uh, they are quite uh, more uh, mixed and, and overlap. And this is because we have uh, different observations that are delayed among them. So in, during training, we could find that we are trying to map to the same uh, in space two observations that are seen uh, different regions of, of this map. But in the variational case, we are training by reconstructing a single observation. So this won't happen. In the case of expert trajectories, uh, we can see that if we um, assess the skills discovered on a realistic map, we find some decent results. For instance, in the desert zone, we, where we have this um, is a skill that is encoded in this region. But if we check the forest or this meadow with some lakes uh, around, we see that the navigation goals are quite mixed and overlap. And this is not good for the agent because um, if we have this navigation goal that is spread out over the map, um, it will confuse the agent and it, it will want to learn where it has to go. So we will go overcome this issue um, with uh, adding some more, more input to the network as we will see in the third experiment. So another way for assessing the, the skills discovered is to perform um, a dimensionality reduction over the embeddings learned uh, with this first approach. And uh, for instance, we could use the principal components, component analysis or any other method like TSNE or UMAP. Um, as you can see in the variational case, uh, we could not find any proper cluster. And we hypothesized that it might be because the training is done with a single observation. Uh, but in the contrastive case, since we are mapping uh, different uh, well, observations from with a given delay, uh, we can learn some relationships that are more more meaningful. And in fact, we can see in this uh, in this plot that the night and daytime observations are quite distinguishable. And also, we can see some other clusters like the sea, desert over here, and meadow, and some some others that are not easy to spot. So once we have these uh, skills discovered, we can perform this last stage of the of the experiment, which is the skill learning. And for that, I, I list here three experiments that I think it shows the progress that we've done during the project. And um, from the easy, the easiest ones uh, to the more complex ones, 
For instance, in the first one, we will uh, use this simple handcrafted map with random trajectories. In the second one, we will use the this other handcrafted map, which is kind of easy as well, but we are leveraging the expert trajectories. And then in the third one, we try to scale this to a re realistic maps, and we'll have to input uh, something else apart from pixels. And as a reminder, um, these are the top views of the maps, but the agent, what is seen, is the RGB pixels. So an agent sees some, something like this. Well, in the case of the flat map, it won't see mountains around, of course, but uh, this is what the agent is, is seeing during the skill learning phase. Okay. Okay, so this in this first experiment, as I said, we um, use a handcrafted map of random trajectories. Uh, we use a contrastive approach for, learn, for discovering these skills. And for instance, here I, I show some results with the second skill discovered, which, as you can see, encodes the region on the top right corner. Uh, if we assess this, uh, this agent once it's trained, we can see that the trajectories in evaluation, regardless of the initial direction of the agent, they go towards the region that we are interested on in general. And if we plot also the average reward, we can see that it, it uh, obtains uh, an unstable reward of almost one uh, with all the trajectories. And it takes between 10 and 20 steps to reach this, this region. Um, now I'm going to show a couple of examples. In this case, since we have the contrastive approach, we cannot reconstruct and, and observe which is the conditioning um, goal. But uh, here I, I tell you that this was conditioned on the um, blue region. And we see that this is quite easy, straightforward, because it sees from the very beginning. But for instance, in, in this other case, that this condition on the green region, the beginning does not see this region, but once the agent is orientated, it knows where to go. But again, these are very simple um, trainings. So in the second experiment, um, we have another handcrafted map that I'm going to show in the next slide. In this case, we discovered these skills from expert trajectories, and we are going to use this variational approach. Since we use this variational, we can reconstruct the latents uh, learned during the uh, skill discovery phase. And actually, if we reconstruct them, we can see that the expert trajectories encode uh, skills mostly uh, of uh, water, uh, forest, meadow, and they are quite, uh, they, they do not encode much, many different scenarios. But as, as we can see, for instance, the first skill probably will encode all the observations that contain some kind of desert uh, accretion. Then we have all these other three that will encode uh, similar skills uh, about uh, forest or, or meadows, and these other underwater, shallow waters, and uh, a sea during nighttime. So, for instance, here I show one of the hardest skills, which was a kind of mix between forest and a meadow. And as you can see, the, the observations that encode this skill are a little bit spread out over the map in this central region and over here around the forest. And the evaluations are set in this, for this agent, at least and they, it keeps the, the agent in the region and also around the, the forest, although the reward is quite erratic and uh, with a high variance. So here we show some uh, interesting examples with this viewer, where here you can see um, not only the, the trajectory of the agent, but also the, the trajectory from top. So here you can see that this red dot is the agent. Here we can see the, um, the reward over time of the agent and the conditioning, the reconstruction of the conditioning latent. And I especially like this uh, trajectory since we can see that the agent falls in the, this deep water, but it manages to get out of the water and it stays in this desert region. And whenever it sees some grass, it turns around and keeps in, in, this, in the region interested. In this other case, this, is one, uh, this one is quite easy because we are conditioning on a dark place. The agent enters this dark room. Once it sees a clear space, 
it turns around and it goes to another uh, dark uh, space. And in this last experiment, that is quite difficult, it is kind of forest, even though it enters through the dark room, it manages to get out and it stays in this forest uh, region. So for the last type of experiments, we try to scale these ideas to um, realistic uh, Minecraft maps. But uh, as I told you before, um, if we leverage the skills discovered by expert trajectories, all, all of them are quite over, uh, mixed and, and they overlap. So we cannot use this as, a, as navigation goals. And actually, uh, if we check the distribution of the uh, skills, in, in this map, we can see that there are four of them that are not even found in this map. So uh, we can uh, assume that the skills discovered are quite generic and for some purposes can be useful, but if we want to treat it, uh, them as uh, navigation goals, they are not. And actually, if we do the same, but with, uh, with uh, random trajectories in this particular map, we'll have uh, the same problem even more accentuated, although the distribution over the skills is going to be more equally distributed. So ideally, what we would like is to have um, something more like this. And these uh, navigation goals are uh, discovered only by using the coordinate. That is actually what EDL, the, the paper that we are based on, was doing. And as you can see, the regions are not exactly the same because we have this third dimension, which is the altitude. Um, but yeah, ideally, what what we would like is some kind of uh, trade-off between uh, visual resemblance and uh, rel relative positions to, to an initial position. And intuitively, this is like uh, we as humans, we could be in a in a desert where we cannot uh, distinguish anything visually. But uh, if we set uh, an initial position and then we say, okay, let, let's do uh, one hundred steps steps forward and then we're going to turn right uh, 50 and then we come back to the initial point and we instead of going this direction we do uh, 50 steps to the left um, we can even though these places look the same we can distinguish these places by the relative position to this initial one right so we try to leverage this idea to to our work uh, so uh, the agent is capable or of uh, distinguishing uh, similar zones, not only by the visual resemblance, but also uh, with the relative position. So uh, we use the vector quantized variational autoencoder again with two different branches, one encoding the, the pixel observations and the other one encoding coordinates. And as you can see now, uh, the navigation goals are more discrete. They are not that overlap as, as before, uh, but they still rely a little bit on the visual resemblance. So um, here I, I show uh, one example with this uh, the third skill learned that encodes this bottom left corner of, of the map. And the trajectories of the agent uh, are perfectly learned and they um, guide the agent towards this region. And again, the, the reward is uh, more stable once again. So now, uh, since we have um, not only the, the pixel reconstruction, but also uh, the coordinate reconstruction of the centroid that we are um, conditioning our policy on, uh, we can plot in the coordinate uh, view the reconstruction of this latent uh, Vector. For instance, here we have the, this skill that reconstructs this image and this position. We can see that the agent successfully goes towards this direction, which is kind of a swampy pantano place where you see this water, this uh, color of the grass, these hanging things from the trees and uh, that are quite similar to the, to the skill. And in, it is in this, this place. So uh, to conclude, I um, would like to mention that we presented two abstra uh, extended abstracts.
to this embodied AI workshop at the CPPR, CPPR conference, one more focused on these last experiments that I was showing you with pixels and coordinates, and another one more focused on the first type of experiments, uh, the pixel, which is called pixel EDL, along with uh, Roger Creus and, and Chevy Giro. And uh, to wrap up, uh, I would like to highlight a uh, few things. Uh, the first one would be that we empirical, empirically demonstrate that expert trajectories are sufficient for discovering generic skills. Although, as, as I showed, if we try to scale this to, to realistic maps, we have to include or add some extra information. And then we also uh, we maximize this empowerment either using variational and, and contrastive approaches. And uh, even though the variational has been around uh, since the very beginning, I think the uh, we haven't seen much uh, literature on contrastive approaches maximizing this mutual information. And last but not, not least, we successfully learned meaningful skills by using the reverse form of the mutual information, which uh, we think that could be useful uh, if we leverage these is is uh, skills discovered by a hierarchical policy that could solve more complex tasks. So thank you very much. If you have any questions.